I want freedom, freedom and space exploration and the next renaissance. And I don't care if nobody even knows my name in the future because my genetics are going to be carried on forever. I'm a human and I'm coming. I'm animated. I'm alive. My heart's big. It's got hot blood going through it fast. I like to fight. I like to eat. I like to have children. I'm here. Hello, Chapo. It's episode 40. Uh, you may have noticed there's no cold open this week. I apologize for that, but we just couldn't think of anything. And to be quite honest, so many people told me after last week's that my impression of Ben Shapiro is uncanny that I feel it's actually backfired on me because now I'm secretly insecure that I sound anything like his nasal, squeaky uh, death rattle. I don't know. But I'm never doing the Ben Shapiro impression again, so enjoy it while it lasted. But while there's no cold open this week, there is a hot flash. <laughs> there's a heat stroke. <laughs> we want to go, yeah, let's go straight into the breaking news. We're recording this on Sunday, 9-11, the day of remembrance. Um, but, uh, Felix, what's the breaking news coming out of Lower Manhattan? All right, so... Hillary was just getting done at his speech, like, presumably to private donors, uh, you know, like, probably some, like, think tank called, like, the Institute for Progress and Prosperity, or, like, Robert Kagan wearing a Hannibal Lecter mask, or people <laughs> who are part of the racist uh, mortgage derivative unit at Goldman Sachs, or just, like, a speech at Central Park where she's, like, uh... She, like, takes the guy in the Elmo costume and she's like, I may not be the Muppets, but I'm taking Manhattan. And nobody told her that Elmo <laughs> isn't a Muppet. But anyway, she, she was doing any number. Yeah. No, no. She was at the she was at the the, the 9-11 memorial this morning. Yeah. She was at the 9-11 memorial, like, doing Democrat voice. Uh, she always does. And, uh, you know, we've been making fun of this for several months because... People like Gateway Pundit, uh, the dying pundit, are like, Hillary is also dying, but holy shit, she actually might be because she fucking fainted and left her shoe behind. Uh, almost a nod to Carl Diggler, who's going to try to find the shoe. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, wow. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah, it turns out that all of the basement-dwelling psychopaths who've been convinced, trying to convince us for months now that Hillary has, like, Morgellons and Legionnaires disease and... Uh, they were right, so I will never doubt them again. I'm going to start looking into race <laughs> realism because clearly they they're onto something. Also, yeah, anime. Uh, I'm going to give it a shot. I never watched anime, <laughs> but you know, maybe these guys know what they're talking about. If you saw the video, it, it it does not look good. If you're a you know a Hillary partisan, and you can tell how touched they are by how angrily dismissive they are of all of this, and it, it's pretty hilarious. They're so yeah, shook. Peter, they're so yeah. shook. Yeah. Our boy Peter Dow was like, anyone who tries to make a political uh, pay out of this is, should be ashamed of themselves. <laughs> Matt, I love yeah. your... I loved your little uh, Tim Kaine as Frank Card. Oh, yeah. Know, once again, his master I, plan is As someone said, he's like... He's like... Uh, he's uh, like putting ground glass into her food or something. <laughs> yeah, he's, like, that, he's, that dipshit yokel, like harmonica playing Hayseed, is secretly like... Uh, getting her sick, and now he's going to be president. He's in the catbird seat to become the leader of the free world. Oh, I do declare. <laughs> well, this is what's funny about the, the Hillary Clinton dying conspiracy that's now a conspiracy fact, is that even if you're like the, the alt-right or gateway pundit, the like we mentioned, the half-blind dying pundit who knows these things because he is also dying, I don't understand, I don't understand how this serves you well. Like, I, he, she still has a vice president. That's the thing. Like, it's that she's like the least popular Democrat they could conceivably have on this ticket. 
any other Democrat like, in the world would be killing Trump by it, like maybe at least like three or four more percentage points than she is. And that's like so easily everybody's favorite grandpa, Tim Kaine. So easily, like fucking Hillary has been so sick with uh, Epstein Barr that the only major speech she's made in the last few months is when she condemned Pepe frogs, and she's like still winning. And like anyone would do anyone better. Would do better. Well, this is a the, this is a story that bears close watching. And I did notice just now she emerged from Chelsea Clinton's apartment on the upper. Oh East God, side that's so funny! Going, I feel great, everybody, and just wait. wait you know, they put they brought her in there and they hit her in the chest with the needle from Pulp Fiction. <laughs> do you think Hillary has like? Lots of body doubles like Saddam Hussein. Like that, no, that's an actress. I think that they really gave her like an adrenaline shot, and they're like, Hillary, you need to go out there and say, I may not be Joel Santana, but I'm back from the dead. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna so, overuse Democrat voice today, guys. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, uh, yeah. What, what what we're lacking in Ben Shapiro, we're making up for in uh, in Democrat voice, but. Um, yeah, this is a story that bears uh, bears watching. But you know, as we mentioned, we are recording this on Sunday, the fifteenth anniversary of nine eleven, or you know, it's a time when we must never forget. And but what I mean by that is we must never forget the fact that um, the Dana Carvey film Master of Disguise was filming the Turtle Club scene when nine eleven happened, and the cast and crew um, paused for a moment of silence. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, Please Google Dana Carvey, Master of Disguise, and Turtle right now. Turtle. May I help you? Are you a member of the Turtle Club? Well, not exactly. Not exactly. But am I not turtly enough for the Turtle Club? Yeah, it's, it's one of the uh, greatest moments in film f- history. And America. Easily, history. if not the greatest. Just imagining Dana Carvey, like, with his head down, a solemn look on his face with the bald cap and the giant turtle shell. <laughs> Today, it's, uh, what I love about 9-11, every 9-11, not the one, original one, that was bad, but all the subsequent <laughs> ones, especially since the advent of Twitter, are all of the Bush administration ghouls who basically live tweet their Ari Fleischer as they think back on it and all the awesome presidential leadership that was going on that Holy day. Holy shit, oh, yeah. It's like, it, it's like they're remembering Woodstock. It's the most ghoulish shit you can watch. Ari Fleischer, every year on 9-11, like, retweets, like, he narrates his his, his day. It, like, it's the fucking best thing that ever happened to him. And and this this motherfucker said today, I, I my hope is that, you know, people, and especially young people, could just go back and remember, like, the gravity that we all felt on that day. And that, to me, really sums up the mentality of these fucking jackals. It's just like, hey, remember how um, just sort of scared, bewildered, and just generally out of sorts you felt on that day? Let's all go back to that. Let's feel I, like that because it's probably the last time anyone took you, them seriously. I also like, I like that he, like, he said, I wish young people could go back in time and witness 9-11. It's like, they know he doesn't want people to go back in time and stop 9-11. He just like, <laughs> wants everyone to experience it. He wants everyone to experience how great it was. <laughs> he's like, he's just like letting his mask slip that he thinks it's great. They're going to build a time machine just so that they can take entire generations of like first grade kids and like they're going to build some sort of like floating uh, observatory. And so everybody, every generation of kids can as part of like a state mandated field trip gets sent back to 9-11 to be traumatized and then brought back so that they can be you know uh, on board with the war on terror lasting another thousand years yeah I mean well this is this speaks to something pretty interesting because in the next few years we'll be having the first voting block that doesn't remember 9-11 but does remember the 2008 recession they'll be voting for the first time and they're not beholden to the same fears that even a lot of millennials are and there's a pretty fucking clear anxiety about that generation if you're somebody like Ari Fleischer so he's um, I mean you know we like to say there are no conspiracies people just always show you their ass and there you go like he just wants everyone to be constantly afraid like him yeah he's, he's a he's a fucking ghoul um I think that's mainly what we should remember on 9-11 is that we shouldn't take any of these people seriously. 
Uh, we're going to be talking, actually, we're going to be talking a little bit more about this in, in the second half of the show. But before that, um, it's 9-11, but it's also uh, football day. It's the kickoff of the football season. And we had a long conversation with Greg Howard of the New York Times about the culture of sports and the, like politics and racism um, and just the, generally the culture and politics of sports in America. So what say you? Shall we roll that interview? Yeah. Let's do it, boys. <laughs> so we're uh, joined now by Greg Howard. Greg, how you doing? I'm great, man. How you doing? Excellent. Now, if you've listened to the show, and uh, for our listeners out there, know that it's sort of it's our tradition that every time we have a guest on, uh, we play the national anthem and we all stand for it. So if you don't mind, um, we're just going to play that. Now we're going to play the Carl Lewis rendition of the national anthem, which I think is the most stirring one. But I just want to make sure all four of us stand and put our hands over our hearts. Um, I mean, we're talking to each other audio, so I'm going to trust. That we're all doing. You that. could you tell. I say you can tell. I've always said you could tell when you somebody isn't standing for it, even over the radio. I'm standing on my chair. I'm actually standing on my chair. <laughs> okay, it, standing is okay, but you have to have your hand over your heart while we play the national anthem. We do it every week on this show. We can't talk to anyone without doing it. So, producer Brendan, please roll Carl Lewis singing the national anthem, and we will just play a bit of that. But we'll all stand here solemnly. Um, recognizing and respecting our national song. Oh, 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 say can you see and the rockets red flag. Uh oh, I'll make up for it now. For oh, the land of the free yeah obviously uh, we want to talk about our national song and uh, those million dollar athletes who have the audacity to uh, disrespect it but uh, before we get into that uh, Greg I wanted to ask you um, what's going on with uh, Univision and Deadspin at the moment I saw like did they delete some articles or something what's going on with that they did delete some articles they deleted articles from um, uh from Deadspin, Jezebel, and Gizmodo, um, six in all, and I and I, they're doing it to dodge litigation from um, our greatest citizens, like like one Chuck Johnson, who may or may not have shit on the floor in college. We don't know. I don't know that. Um, no one ever accused him of definitely shitting on the floor in college. Um, but there's one, you know, it's one article that that I wrote for Deadspin. Where I don't know how it happened, but we started talking shit via email to each other, and then he was like, "By the way, I definitely did not poop on the floor in college." And I didn't. Wait, Chuck Chuck Johnson said that to you in an email. Yeah, I didn't. I, I didn't bring that up. Like no one, no one, <laughs> no one accused my man of shitting on the floor in college. I had no idea what he was talking about. Uh, and so you know, so I I, I said and uh, you know I, I posted a blog. Saying, did did this man, this wonderful citizen, did he did he shit on the floor in college? Um, because I didn't know, I didn't know where it came from. Uh, and so Greg is just asking questions. I'm just people. asking questions. Yeah, and and that's and I I feel like I have the right to do that. I mean, um, it's called journalism, right? Like that's the whole essence yeah. of the thing. Like no one said he definitely shit on the floor. No, no one said that. I didn't say that. No one has ever said. Well, people have said he definitely shit on the floor, but I didn't. And so. Um, I, I guess Univision is trying to completely um, wash their hands of all the Gawker package um, that they... they retroactively they, censored your story. Posing, yeah, man. Just investigating the question of whether Chuck C. Johnson sh- defecated on his college dorm room. Yeah, floor. And, I, and I mean, my whole thing was like the story's not done yet. You know, uh, we haven't we haven't really figured out the answer to the question yet and so for them you know for Univision to come up short it's really cowardly and like I mean you know to uh, to a larger point um, this is the thing that everyone feels with Peter Thiel right like wh- however you feel about Gawker and you should feel good about Gawker because Gawker is good um, like however you feel about that it, it was it was kind of alarming for a billionaire with their feelings hurt to 
basically um, destroy a company. Like, Gawker Media is no more, you know? Uh, and when you see um, chumps like Chuck Johnson and and other people, like Mitch Williams, also a chump, um, who threaten Gawker, you know, who th- not even Gawker, who threaten Univision, who threaten, uh, you know, a, a media company with a TV channel and shit. Um, with a lawsuit, and they don't even have the the fortitude to to fight for their writers, or you know, and they you know, so there's that, and there's also you know the, how how dishonest is it to delete an article from the internet like it never happened? You know, like if you're gonna if you're gonna do fearless intrepid journalism and ask fearless questions like if Chuck Johnson shot on the floor in college, or if he <laughs> did, like you know, if he fucked a sheep, that's another question we ask. It's not getting enough. It's not getting enough play for some reason, you know. Like compared to you know shitting on the floor, I feel like fucking a sheep is is much more serious. But you know, if you're gonna ask questions like that, you know, and you're gonna you're gonna do fearless journalism like that, I don't understand um, how you could then turn around and delete the articles. You got to be accountable for what happens, you know. And this is this is always a problem with Gawker. There's always when Gawker writers and editors get upset. It's like well, no one's saying we don't fuck up, but um, when we do, you have to be accountable for it. That's the, that's the only thing that s- separates Gawker, we thought, from, um, like BuzzFeed, listicles and stuff like that, and 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 Fusion, really, <laughs> you know. So, but now we're Fusion. Well, this so. is uh, indeed chilling. I mean, it reminds me of George Orwell's 1984, where they uh put things in the memory hole, including uh, the time Winston Smith got a boner and everyone laughed at him. Exactly. Right That's probably. exactly what this <laughs> is. That's exactly what this is, man. <laughs> well, um, yeah, it does not augur well for the uh, the future of uh, online journalism if a uh, two-bit floor shitter like Chuck Johnson can exercise de facto veto power over um, even even snarky journalism. Because believe me, the the, ser- the the more serious stuff, uh, Jane Mayer and Robert Draper is next. Right. But Greg, so you write for the New York Times. You cover sports, politics, and the the culture of uh, all of those things. And we couldn't have asked for a better constellation than what has uh, lined up um, this week as we're getting ready to kick off the uh, NFL season uh, tomorrow. We're recording this on Saturday, but tomorrow is the I guess the major kick, I mean, there was a game on Thursday, but I'm not really counting that. This is the major kickoff of the NFL season, and it's on the 15th anniversary of 9-11, and this is all happening under the backdrop of Colin Kaepernick and the this protest that he's kicked off about the national anthem that is roiling through the world of uh, sports media. Last I heard, the Seattle Seahawks were planning to do a team-wide Kneel during the national anthem um, in solidarity with Kaepernick. Greg, what do you make of this? And like, do you think that this is like, what do you make of like uh, sort of athletes, particularly in the NFL, which is like uh, America's sport? It's like the number one sports brand in America, taking a political stand like this, and the the rather um, I don't know colicky outrage that's it's inspired among certain parts of their fan base. I mean, I think it's I think it's good that athletes are taking political stance um i my whole i guess my whole stance is that it's not necessary um for athletes to do it who don't feel that way but you know i i think with so much going on in terms of you know uh uh, the national awareness of, of police brutality and not not just um police shooting black people dead in the back and shit right like like over policing and under policing in black neighborhoods and stuff like that, and um, police harassment. Uh, it, it's really, I think it's uh, a tragedy of sorts. And, you know, I think it's good that athletes um, are aware. I think it's really telling that athletes are becoming aware of it, which means that, you know, it, it's too loud to be ignored. You know, I mean, every political candidate this season has talked about Black Lives Matter and so on. and. I don't think police police brutality was really um, in the national conversation three years ago, you know, um, as a thing that needed addressing. And so, I, I don't think all the Seahawks are going to um, kneel in solidarity with um, Colin Kaepernick and Brandon Marshall, and you know. But I, it would be awesome if they did because. 
I mean, you know, first of all, uh, police brutality has nothing to do with 9-11 or the military or, or the flag or whatever, right? Um, and and any protests against that have nothing to do with uh, one's love for their country or anything like that. But I, I also believe that, um, you know, if, if the athletes start... Uh, I guess utilizing their their rights and and speaking up to the point where it has to be addressed and cause such a national outrage that it, it must be addressed by the NFL. Then only good things can happen from there. Well, I'm a little suspicious the the fact that it's the Seattle Seahawks and it's the 15th anniversary of 9/11. At least I'm suspicious that I don't know if it's about police brutality or if it's Pete Carroll's uh, sly way of getting us to Google Tower Seven and uh, not. Yeah, I mean Pete Carroll's now. definitely going to be kneeling, right? <laughs> 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 like, Pete Carroll has some questions that need to be answered, uh, and I respect Pete Carroll and I, and I will love him always for that for just for asking the same questions. You know, he's uh, actually I don't respect him for that. He's a terrible person, but you know, <laughs> but uh, I mean even. Uh, I mean, the thing that you see, I, mean, I guess, to segue off Pete Carroll's uh, <laughs> obsession with Tower 7 and, and if, you know, if steel beams can be melted, is that, like, it's always going to be athletes, right? But once I think you get coaches and general managers and, you know, I don't think any owners are going to be kneeling or talking about police brutality or anything like that. But, you know, if you could get a Pete Carroll or, you know, or something like that to kneel, then it would it would add uh, not credibility but it would it would i guess it would cause white people to start believing <laughs> black people that's always what happens right like you need a strong uh white dude to co-sign that's why that's why glenn beck being like oh i think black lives matter um activists might have a point perhaps and might be actual humans um that ran in the new york times this week i thought it was a really weak column to be honest and i thought it was really lukewarm and you, you know for you to say we should have empathy for for black lives matter and say we should have empathy for anyone i think it's the weakest possible stance someone can take but you know that's what glenn beck took and it was why it was wild because he was the white dude giving a cosign to black lives matter and so it it kind of uh it kind of sparked the whole thing, like, you know, how, how seriously should we take them? How seriously should we take um, Glenn Beck? Like, you know, is Glenn Beck a traitor now? Is, is Glenn Beck black now? You know, and... Uh, uh, yes, is the answer to that Yes, question. the answer is yeah. Glenn Beck black is... The answer is as fuck. Glenn Beck is definitely black as fuck. But, uh... Yeah, uh, you, you guys hear, heard it here first. Uh, Glenn Beck has permission to say the N-word. <laughs> yeah, or if yeah. you're on the other side of yes. things, Glenn Beck is now a cuck. Put him on the cuck board. Glenn Beck can no longer catch a cab. <laughs> Sorry, Glenn Beck. Well, Uber from here. A, 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 lot of, a lot of, like, the, the NFL fan base was really, obviously super pissed off about Colin Kaepernick. To the point that I saw yesterday, boycott the NFL was trending. And when I first saw that, I, I thought, usually it's like, you know, sicko libs that are boycotting the NFL because it's violent or exploitative or whatever. But no, these were the, uh, this is the opposite. People were saying that they were going to boycott the NFL because one of their players didn't stand for the flag or something like that. And Matt, I saw you had a, a lot of fun talking to some of these folks. Yeah, I did. All I did was point out the crushingly obvious fact that none of these couch potatoes are actually going to boycott the NFL. Their entire like life praxis is based around their own material comfort and also their own f fascination with violence, both like uh, uh, sort of a vicarious enjoyment of America's military adventures overseas and then the more uh, symbolic but visceral violence of Sunday NFL games and there's no way in hell they're gonna actually get their fat asses to like what are they gonna do on Sunday what are these guys gonna do check they're not going to church they're not going to church they ain't going to church they got <laughs> glucose's level I mean what are they gonna do uh, but yeah so I did a hashtag thing and I just said there's zero chance that you wads are actually gonna stop watching football and the best response was from this guy Cody Alvarez who like was losing it and he's like, violence obsessed? What about those Black Lives Matter protests that turn into viol to riots? I guess that's okay. 
Uh, but the best one was one of my followers, Trevor Kavanaugh, said, Cody, do you agree that if the troops wanted to, they could form a team and dominate the NFL? <laughs> and Cody's response was so good, I want it tattooed on my body. He said, they wouldn't do something to entertain a nation that is ungrateful for their sacrifices. Damn. <laughs> So True. Basically, his, his his thesis is that the troops could dominate the NFL, but will not because True. we don't appreciate them enough. I see no lies well, here. <laughs> my favorite response that you got was the guy who said, he's like, buddy, I'm sticking to watching NCAA and my Saints. That's my favorite team and playing in this half dozen fantasy leagues. But other than that. I'm not watching any of it yeah, on that television. Guy amazing. That guy is like a that guy is a never Trump cruise cuck from Alabama or something. <laughs> and it, it was such a just a dorky thing. He says, uh, "Oh, this is it. Ha! Huh, good one. I'm gonna try though. Actually, I'm gonna just watch college Bama and my fave NFL team, the Saints. Wow! Isn't that literally what everyone does? Like pretty much everybody <laughs> no, just watches I, their favorite team. I mean, uh, there's something to be said about doing a sit-in with exactly half your ass. <laughs> <laughs> but the interesting thing is, like, I got one guy. I got one guy who was like, "Oh, I guess you." He's, I said, "Bullshit! You're not gonna to boycott." And one of them was like, "Oh yeah, watch me, you fucking pussy." But then I got another guy who I don't think he understood what the hashtag was about. He thought maybe it was about like concussions or something. And he's like, yeah, right. And what would I do? Drink white wine and have white guilt with you? So hey. like, these guys got to get on the same page, you know? Because they're not used to like, that kind of activism is not really in their DNA. So that's another reason I don't think it's going to work. It's so counterintuitive to them that no matter how much their feelings have been hurt by Colin Kaepernick not standing, no matter how much they feel triggered by having him not stand up for the national anthem, no matter how much they need a safe space in their na- man cave, they're not going to be able to bring themselves to do it. Well, I've I've always wondered what it would be like if BDS was ran by uh, people who have purely hedonistic lifestyles where they never do anything they don't want to do. <laughs> there, I mean, that's the entirety of like the conservative uh, worldview is based around. Okay, I have X amount of material comfort in my life. What politics can I support that will maintain it? Like that's it. Exactly. And a big part of that is football. So good fucking I luck. I think you said the exact right word, which is safe space. And I think for a lot of Americans, like the Sunday NFL lineup is their kind of safe space. It, it's it's where they go to retreat from all, all their troubles and anxieties of the world. And Colin Kaepernick is fucking with that by quote injecting politics in what is an otherwise apolitical spectacle of I don't know a hundred yard American flag being unfurled on the field <laughs> and then a, a stealth bomber flying over it or something like it's that. It's weird that they can't take their but, own uh, advice about, you know, when see people say, hey, I was offended by that or I find that racist or something and they just say, hey, get over it. It's weird how that doesn't apply here. It's a weird how they exactly. can't just well, ignore the fact that the guy didn't stand up. I mean, this is the, this is the thing with everything, right? Like with with any minorities or, or women who say, you know, I got a bone to pick, it's, um, it's, it, it becomes like a huge problem. It, it's really, it, it's really upsetting. I mean, and I, that's the thing with Colin Kaepernick, right? If Colin Kaepernick is a black dude saying, I have a bone to pick, and it becomes a huge problem as in like, like it becomes like an invasion upon uh, American ideals or, you know, or an attack on American ideals as if Colin Kaepernick is not American himself. Now he's coming from the outside and as, an, as opposed to being, you know, an American and, and witnessing flaws in the country. You know, it, it, I, I, don't, how many, I don't know how many people have, you know, pointed this out, but um, when, you know, Donald Trump is running on Make America Great Again and bashing America and saying America's shitty, but he can fix it. Um, when a black dude says America is shitty, it becomes basically heresy. And, you know, that that's, that's always what it comes down to when you're talking about minorities and uh, and minority grievances and, and uh, you know, sexism, gay rights, everything. Well, Greg, I noticed, like, probably the most common response from people who are upset or offended by this is to point out that 
oh, buddy, you feel oppressed in America? Like you're, you have a $19 million contract or just pointing out how that he's been made wealthy from football and, and he's, you know, and by extension, America. But which is also odd because like if you're saying, well, if you have money, then you sort of cede your ability to complain about anything in America, that would mostly negate much of the Republican Party because all they do is fucking gripe about everything that's wrong with this country, despite the fact that many of them are quite well off. Exactly, right. Like, how many things do you have blind love about for, it's, it's generally conservatives, but I, I think it's, you know, it's whites, it's males, um, like you guys. <laughs> you know, it's, it, it becomes like, like America is, is perfect, and I, I can't even get my mind around how that must feel or, or how you could be that, um, uh, that, you know, just uh, unskeptical about about your own life and about your own, you know, what your own circumstances. Well, I mean, it certainly shows that the ups, the degree of upset that people are having about this, and and then they're whining about like, oh, don't put politics into it. But obviously, as we said, you could ignore it very easily and not have it affect your actual watching of the game. The game's still going to happen. It's not like anybody is calling for a strike. Although, holy shit, that would be amazing. People would have fucking aneurysms if that happened. But uh, it's because clearly it's not just an entertainment. Clearly, NFL Sunday for these guys is not just an entertainment. It is an, a total, total nationalistic ritual that has to be maintained in its entirety for it to be worth. It's like an incantation almost. Like the whole day, the whole NFL Sunday is this experience of nationalism and violence and their, the way that they come together. And if any part of it is sullied, if any part of it makes them think for a second about something outside of that, they just get violently angry because clearly they're, it's, it's impacting their ability to carry through with the ritual the way they want. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proud we hail were so gallantly streaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rockets red glare the bombs bursting in air gave proof flag was still there oh say does that star spangled banner yet wave or the land Well, I, I just, in terms of, uh, you know, safe spaces and the way uh, people react to this, I did find uh, one article that I want to share briefly. This is, of course, from the National Review. My, this is my go-to whenever I want a good opinion on something. This is uh, Jim Garrity of the National Review uh, writing about Colin Kaepernick. And the uh, headline is, I just want to enjoy watching the game. Subhead, sports are supposed to provide an escape from politics. And basically throughout this uh, piece, he says something like, 
There are 168 hours in the week, and a lot of those hours can be spent discussing the world's problems, police brutality, lack of accountability, tense racial relations, crime, and threats of dangers. But for three hours on a Sunday afternoon or Sunday night, you know what I want to do? I just want to enjoy watching the game. And then he repeats that phrase in italics five different times in this article. I just want to enjoy watching the game. It's like a mantra. And he says, I don't want to stay woke. I want to take a nap from the troubles of the world. He wrote this while banging on a spoon and a high chair. (laughs) He says, when I tune in, I want to hear about whether the Redskins are any good, not whether the team name offends the announcer. I want to hear about whether the quarterback is more effective in a shotgun formation, not whether Bob Costas thinks we need stricter gun control laws. I want to hear about the holes in the offensive line, not President Obama's unenforced red line in Syria. (laughs) (laughs) Damn. When has that ever happened? This is a good blog. This is a good blog. Did uh, Hillary write this? Did Hillary Clinton write this? (laughs) I don't want to hear about the red line. I want to hear about the red zone. (laughs) Uh, Greg, like, what do you, how do you, like, how how do you perceive, like, the, the sports media's reaction so far to this, I don't know, unwarranted or, you know, unannounced injection of serious issues like patriotism and police brutality into their uninterrupted uh, gab fests. Oh, I think it's all bullshit. I I mean, I I don't know how you can, um, you know, like how you can cover sports and, and without understanding that sports are in a vacuum. You know, and that and that the world obviously seeps into sports, um, and sports seeps into a lot of other things. Um, and the idea that uh, you know that anything is an escape from from everyday life and and also from injustices is you know it's 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 bullshit. There's there's no other way. And you know there's there's all this. Um, I, I I think that there's a generation of sports writer that kind of came up before. Um, I think before like the internet really and blogs where they kind of were you know like it was more democratic um, everyone could start writing about sports everyone can also try to start a dialogue with you based on your your trash article or your great article and stuff and it was you know they, they they could manifest the idea that that sports aren't escape for everything else but you know I mean you're watching all these you're watching you know football and basketball and baseball it's like you know it's a hell of a lot of minorities that play, play these sports man <laughs> you know it's like you know they're leaving the stadium getting pulled over and shit man like, <laughs> like you know they're not they're gonna be you know they're gonna be athletes for what 30 years so like the very best ones um and then they got to live another 40 or 50 or if it's football, you know, 20 years of, <laughs> of, like, of being uh, an American, you know. And, and it's amazing to me how anyone could pretend that uh, that sports are an escape from anything. Whenever someone says that, I know um, not to take them seriously. Well, I haven't seen much, but actually, uh, thanks to your timeline, I did see my favorite uh, clip about Colin Kaepernick, and that was none other than, uh, it was on Skip Bayless's new Fox Sports show, and it was none other than Ray Lewis uh, offering his thoughts on this, which were, leave the flag out of it. Just leave the flag alone. There are people who fought for that flag, and it's like, thanks, Ray. Yeah, <laughs> man. Glad it's, you could chime in. No, one, no one's talked about the flag, Uncle Ray. Like, honestly, Uncle Ray, no one's talked about the flag, man. I went to school in Baltimore when when the Ravens won uh, uh, Super Bowl, and it was awesome. And I love Uncle Ray forever. No one's talking about the flag. It's like, shut the fuck up. Like, this is this is the problem. It's always like the moving of the goal of the goalpost, right? It's it's we're talking about police brutality. That's what Colin Kaepernick is talking about. And suddenly we're talking about the troops, which have nothing to do with any of this, <laughs> which like many troops made very clear. And it was trending on Twitter like last week, like, uh, what were they, Troops for Colin Kaepernick? You know, uh, they were who, they were all stealing valor. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Or veteran for Kaepernick or something like that. Yeah. No one's talking about troops. No one's talking about the flag. I don't think anyone ever said anyone ever said that. You know, uh, no one's even really talking about the national anthem. It's just it's just a means through which Colin Kaepernick was able to um, get his protests heard, you know, and and 
when people are talking about the flag and and the troops and uh, they're they're deflecting and they're not talking about the real thing, which is that you know police brutality, not just you know the killing of black people, which happened once every <coughs> twenty five hours uh, last year, if I'm correct. Um, but not even that, but just you know um, harassment and then under policing and and in areas that need it you know, and, and lack of infrastructure, um, lack of resources that like, that's what we're talking about, but no one really wants to talk about that. Um, and take that argument at face value because, um, that's the argument you're going to lose and it's going to make you feel bad about yourself and about your nation as it should. And so instead you say, um, come on, man, the game's on. Do you, as someone who covers sports, do you ever, watch sports and find your or watch a game or, or watch anything and find yourself giving yourself over to it in, in any way or is it like is it is it hard to is it sort of like working in a candy factory where eventually you get sick of uh, chocolate or I mean do you like do you ever find yourself giving yourself over to the moment or to the the innocence of like the ideal of what we imagine sports to be or is it too hard yes I mean it, it's it's weird I, I, I find myself really um I guess hating sports <laughs> uh, more and more every day, and you know that comes from that comes from also just being more educated about them and about the business around them, but also just uh, you know from covering sports a lot. I, I don't I don't really like covering sports, man. Uh, but <laughs> you know, but but uh, I don't know. I, I was I was an athlete my whole life. Um, uh, I. I, I think I, I think like I, I love basketball in a vacuum, right? I, I love soccer in a vacuum. But then you have to talk about, you know, NCAA, and you have to talk about FIFA, and you have, you know you have to talk about NBA and and how they're keeping players from going pro at a certain age, um, and that disgusting, uh, concerned, trolly nature of it. And it's basically, you know, you talk about NCAA, NBA in cahoots to keep talent in the NCAA so that they can profit more off of unpaid labor and stuff. And it gets really gross. It gets really gross, right? It gets in with, you know, with all the problems in football, it gets really hard to watch a football game all the way through. Um, but, you know, when when the Golden State Warriors were 3-1 down and, I mean, 3-1 up in the, you know, NBA championship and then LeBron James pulled his dick out and put it on the table and just won three straight um, and destroy all of Silicon Valley um, <laughs> in a week. Yeah, I cried. <laughs> you know, uh, like you know, I mean, as disgusting as the Olympics are, right? And as as disgusting as their purpose is, as disgusting as Michael Phelps is, right? <laughs> like uh, when he won and he started crying, I got I got a little choked up. You know, like um, when Carmelo Anthony when they won the gold medal. <laughs> you know, against. Uh, a team of nobodies really compared to who the United States had when their B team, the United States had their B team and they won the Olympic gold medal. Um, you know, you, you get choked up and it's because, you know, it, um, sports are beautiful and you're looking at people realizing their dreams. Um, and you're, and you're looking at beauty. You're looking at art. Same reason, you know, why music might make you emotional or, or TV or, or, or something like that might make you emotional. I don't, I don't think sports are all too different as consumers from any of those. Um, that said, you, if, if you're not keeping everything, you know, you can, you can love LeBron James, you know, almost dunking on Draymond Green after Draymond punched him in the ball sack and like, and enjoy that. And that can choke you up. You can also be like, well, you know, uh, LeBron's owner, you know, is, is the owner of Quicken Loans. You know, he's like he's he's a corporate loan shark, dude, and that's why that's how he's like putting uh, food in his rich ass kids' mouths. You know, like that's that's how he's doing it by stealing from black and brown people in the very community where he erected an arena. You can you can you can you can have both, and if you if you don't have both, you're either an idiot or you're lying. Sports are multi billion dollar business, and the fact is, you don't make all that money uh, and get away with uh, clean hands or without exploiting somebody. Exactly. And even the athletes, even the athletes, even though they make a lot of money, I mean, you can make an argument that um, 
a, a lot of them were being exploited too, especially in football. For sure, and I mean, and I mean that's the thing. I think you know with with that spin, you know, I, I think there's some of they might be the first place you see a, a lot more often now. Where um, I was talking to a coworker in New York Times about this yesterday, and she was talking about how she like. You know, she calls the players entitled and, you know, and she sort of sides with the owners more and stuff. And I'm like, I don't know, man, if, you, if you're going to either if you're going to side with millionaire, um, own, if you're millionaire players who have, you know, a, a very limited window of, of earning potential um, or billionaire owners, <laughs> you know, who, who work day in and day night, uh, day in and day out to suppress their wages and stuff. You know, um, so that they can become richer billionaires. I, you know, I'm rolling with the entitled millionaires every time. You know, and and, <laughs> and that wasn't really that wasn't really uh, I don't think of a, a really popular uh, view to take before. You know, maybe eight five to eight years ago. It's hard for me to imagine anyone could look at uh, Woody Johnson or Jerry Jones, who's not a billionaire, and think, yeah. I I I identify with those guys. Well, I mean, you see people look at Donald Trump, who's not a billionaire, and saying, "Yeah, I identify with him," right? <laughs> you know, like, I mean, you, you you see people with that because they're they are. I, I guess they're. I mean, we could even talk about this. Like, I don't I don't see that much to aspire to when I look at Donald Trump, but I guess he he is rich, right? And he is a bully. I mean, he got like Jeb Bush out the paint by basically calling him a bitch on national television <laughs> over and over again, right? We've, he, co- we've covered that extensively. Jeb Bush is the weakest person on this stage by far. Jeb is a waste, and everybody knows it. He is so weak, it's laughable. Jeb is a mess. <laughs> Jeb is a waste. Jeb is a mess. <laughs> Jeb is a big fat mistake. Yeah, he basically called Jeb Bush and, and Marco Rubio a bitch over and over and over again. <laughs> and like that's why that's why he's not very good Hillary Clinton because and I guess there's some there's something about that sort of of brand of power, you know. Um, and I get that manifestation of power that uh, people are really drawn to because you know no one no one is, can look me in the eye and say that. Donald Trump knows what he's talking about. No one could look me in the eye and say that Jerry Jones is a good guy, but uh, well, you know Trump's got his his name on some buildings, and Jerry Jones, um, he's got the Cowboys. You know, and I, I guess that's aspiration. Yeah, because they're like they're rich guys the way that people imagine that they would be rich if they had that kind of money. Oh, I would fucking own a football team yeah, and I'd run yeah. that shit. I'd tell everybody to kiss my ass. That right, I, exactly. I would have a giant gold-plated house, and it would look like shit, but nobody would say anything because I'm too rich. <laughs> right. Like that, exactly, that's exactly right. what they. And so they they see that and they relate to it. Like weirdo tech millionaires or like or like real mutants like Warren Buffett. Like Democrats always think people love Warren Buffett. Hey, he's the relatable billionaire. He eats ice cream. He lives in a shitty house in Omaha. But that's the freakiest thing I, there is. Like, what the hell kind of weirdo has billions of dollars and, like, and you know, goes to Denny's all the time? Like, people relate to exactly. a guy like Trump and a, a guy like Jerry Jones because, like, yes, they're bawling with their money. That's what I would do. I relate to uh, Mark Cuban, but, but that's because he has quite a good film production company as well and has put out some decent movies over the years. I actually love Mark Cuban. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm not supposed to, but... I, I love Mark Cuban. Uh, my first newspaper job was in Dallas, and he has this weird thing about how he answers every uh, how he answers every email. <laughs> and so I would like I was like a twenty what twenty three twenty four, and just I was twenty three, and I was just like emailing one of the richest people in the history of the universe. And he was he was writing back in like lowercase and shit, and I was, I was like, "This guy is awesome." And then I uh, and then I got to like cover uh, the Mavericks and uh, Delonte Delonte West Delonte West Delonte West Delonte Eleanor Roosevelt High School class of two thousand I believe. Uh, but yeah, that's uh, like I wanted to profile Delonte in my first ever story, and I asked Mark Cuban. 
And he was like, yeah, of course you can, Greg. And then uh, then he, like, forwarded to, to Dallas Mavericks PR. And they're like, no, of course you can't. You're stupid. Why would you ever think this is okay? Um, but since then, I've, like, I've fucked with Mark Cuban really hard. <laughs> Sorry, that's one Mark Cuban story. The only thing would be better if he answered your email in all caps instead of all lowercase. Right? Yeah, that'd be so great. I would. I think I would hate him if he did that. My homie on the Cavaliers, uh, Dan Gilbert, who wrote like the runaway slave letter to LeBron James in Comic Sans. That was my shit. Also, though. Wait, wait. Could you explain? Could you? Could you go over again for our listeners the Dan Gilbert letter? I, I remember this, but maybe our listeners aren't familiar with this. This is when he left the Cavaliers for the first time to go to Miami, right? Yeah. So you know, he. I mean, I don't think I've ever heard anyone say that, except LeBron, maybe that that <laughs> Cleveland's a good city, right? <laughs> and so he's from uh, Akron. He's he's he played for the Cavaliers. Like he played high school basketball in Cleveland and then he got drafted by the Cavs. I think he put seven years in of the Cavs and then uh, he hit free agency and he decided to go to South Beach and play with his homies Chris Bosch and Dwayne Wade and win championship because the Cleveland Cavaliers were so bad. And Dan Gilbert, the owner of the Cavs, uh, owner of Quicken Loans, uh, he wrote, uh, it, was, it was literally a runaway slave letter talking about how um, just like a really bitter letter to LeBron James, and I guess open letter about LeBron James, about how LeBron James letting down the city and the team and stuff. And this is the owner of Quick and Loans, man. This is the owner of Quick and Loans talking about how LeBron's letting down the city, and uh, and it's really just his his fury and how incredulous he was that a young black employee was using his agency and exercising his agency. That's what it came down to for me. Um, but he wrote it in, I think, Red Comic Sans, which made everything okay. <laughs> <laughs> like, I was going to get really fired up, and I was like, actually, because he wrote in Comic Sans, it's fine, man. It's fine. I, I, I get where you're coming from. Uh, he he should have written it in Papyrus. It would have given it uh, all, all the more. Yeah, money that's an underrated yeah. bad font. People need to use Papyrus more. The next team that wins a championship has to record a song like the 85 Chicago Bears. We need another Super Bowl shuffle for, for this era. Or the Miami 7th Floor Crew song. 7th Floor Crew, yes. <laughs> With Greg Olson, now playing at the Panthers. Uh, had the Ah, fuck. I used to know Greg Olson's verse by heart. That guy had bars. But, you know, it, it would have been the Warriors. The Warriors would have done like a corny rap song. Um <laughs> So LeBron James pulled his penis out and put it on the table, down 3-1 in the NBA Finals, and uh, that was all she wrote. But they definitely would have done, like, you know, they, they love to dance and and sing and, and uh, you know, listen to Drake and stuff. They definitely would have done uh, a rap song. I am free, sure, I'm, like, I without knowing anything about the whole operation, I'm sure that they had like a rap song planned already. <laughs> you know what I, I mean? feel I feel like <laughs> writing an open letter to LeBron James in papyrus font slamming him for robbing us of this opportunity for, you know, uh the ultimate dad rap song. I wish we lived in a world where they play themselves like that. Yeah. That would have been, yeah. been ideal. Well, Greg, before we let you go, as we've been talking about like sports and, and, and like the the politics of sports, do you see like, where do you see this going? Do you think, like, because there, there was a heyday in American culture, like, in, in the late 60s, where a lot of really prominent athletes became very political. Do you see that, um, like, specifically uh, sort of a confluence with Black Lives Matter? Do you see that happening again at the level that it did in, in the sort of uh, late uh, late 60s with the civil rights movement? No. Um, no? <laughs> in a word. Why not? Is it just too much corporate money? Um, I, th- I think so. I, I mean, like... I mean, LeBron James probably, he might be the most socially conscious athlete out there, right? I I mean, like, you can see that things like police brutality and stuff really eat at him. And with Tamir Rice, he's had it in his own neighborhood and stuff. But, you know, Nike signed him to a lifetime contract, man. You can't, I I don't know. I, I think with, I think there's more to lose now than there was in the 60s in large part because of the activists in the 60s and what they were able to do and and, and, and what they were able to carve out for people of color. Um, like, I, you know, 
I, I forgot what what it was. So like Michael Jordan didn't make that much money off like over his you know over his pro career from basketball. I mean, he made like tens of millions of dollars, but it wasn't really that much compared to what people are making now. You know, thirty million dollars a year, twenty seven million dollars a year. Um, and I think when you have that, when you have family, um, when when you have when you when you when you have the power that comes with being um, beamed all around the world that um, that really didn't exist in the sixties or or the eighties or nineties even, um, you. There, there's more to lose because there's because you could there's so much more to gain and I think that it takes a a different kind of strength and courage, um, and which is why I don't I don't I don't besmirch any athlete for saying fuck that I'm gonna stand during our national anthem or whatever you know because it really does take a lot um, when when LeBron Carmelo Dwayne Wade and who else was it uh, Chris Paul came out during the ESP the ESPs, the ESP and SPs and, you know, they talked about police brutality and stuff. That that took a lot of courage because they all got their own shoes. You know, they all have they all have like huge, huge contracts with with Nike or or Dwayne Wade's like whatever his Chinese company is. You know, and, and when you're risking that and you you know, you I mean I don't you know, you see the NFL owners come out and talk about Colin Kaepernick and saying that, you know, if, if he got cut from the 49ers after doing that, he might have been out of a career. What else is he prepared to do, really? You, you know, outside of play uh, play football, you know, and, and, you know, if you have a kid or, or, or family or, you know, or you come from a poor background and stuff, um, these have very serious life-altering consequences um, to protesting against uh, against you know the authority or any authority and that's in part because of like what you know Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and Muhammad Ali and Jim Brown and uh, you know Tommy Smith and pe- people like that did in the 60s um, that's why you know people of color now have so much more to lose Greg Howard thanks so much for talking to us thanks for having me guys thank you very much thank you Greg well, they call me sweetness, and I like to dance. Running the ball is like Mickey Mouse Mance. We had to go to this training camp to give Chicago a Super Bowl champ. And we're not doing this because we're greedy. The Bears are doing it to beat the needy. We didn't come here to look for trouble. We just come here to do the Super Bowl shot. This is Speedy Will, and I'm world class. I like running, but I love to get the pass. I practice all day and dance all night. I got to get ready for the Sunday fight. Now, I'm as smooth as a chocolate swirl. I dance a little funky, so watch me, girl. There's no one here that doesn't like me. My Super Bowl shuffle will set you free. Okay, we are back. Thanks again to uh, Greg Howard for uh, joining us on this episode. Okay, now... We alluded to it in the beginning of the show, but uh, for the second the second part of the show, we want to talk about something uh, that came up this week. I, I guess we'll sort of do a reading series on it, but I don't think it actually counts as a reading series because this one actually isn't funny. Um, you know, our threshold on this show for things that can genuinely make us mad that we come across online, I, I would say is fairly high. We ascribe to a never mad, never nude type of philosophy. But sometimes something comes along that crosses that line, and I think we found it this week. I'm referring, of course, to an op-ed that ran in the Washington Post um, this week by Dennis Ross. Dennis Ross is a longtime sort of foreign policy hand. He was in the Obama administration. He, like was involved in the Israel Israel Palestine peace process. Um, he he's another fucking jackal, but he wrote an op-ed in the Washington Post this week that was actually shocking to me. It was basically I don't know, just pure propaganda on behalf of Saudi Arabia. And I think it's definitely worth discussing um, in detail. One of the most horribly myopic idiotic things I've ever read. Not only does Ross get basic facts completely wrong, 
it's like just a level of blithe sociopathy and ignorance of the lives of millions of Saudis that only a guy who's fucking paid to think this way could write. I think it's, you know, it, it's breathtaking in how cynical it is because I'm almost positive Dennis Ross believes nothing of what he actually wrote here and the contempt that him and people like him have for the world is astounding. But, I mean, I think it's interesting because I, I think it's indicative of, I don't know, what I, what, I th- what I sort of read is kind of a full court press that's going on right now in the sort of corridors of elite opinion to kind of corral elite opinion on the side of Saudi Arabia in what is a larger kind of proxy war in the Middle East between the Gulf states and Iran and sort of the Sunni Shia split in the Middle East. Would you think that, do you say, would you say that's accurate? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think this goes back to a lot of what we talked about with the Blob episode with Derek Davison, that uh, people like Dennis Ross, I mean, just a little backstory on Dennis Ross. Dennis Ross uh, started out in the Carter administration under Paul Wolfowitz and started there authoring papers about our need to fully embrace uh, our uh, Sunni monarch allies and then just kicked around APAC projects and fucked up peace talks under Bill Clinton and, you know, was of course brought on under Barack Obama because why wouldn't he be? You know, you need a team of rivals. You need, you know, maybe an economist who's a bit of a monetarist and then a guy who's against uh, helicopter money so they can arrive at a consensus. And in Dennis Ross's case, you need a fucking idiot who's failed every major project he's ever been given and doesn't know a fucking thing about anything and anyone who's actually tried to work towards any meaningful outcome in any foreign policy peace project ever fucking hates him. But, uh... I mean, I guess I... I guess I would dispute slightly that he's failed at everything he's ever done. I mean, he has, if you, you know, regard the goal of the peace process is achieving peace, but I think his goal has always been to stall the peace process to let Israel do whatever it wants. Oh, yeah, yeah. We're just gonna... I'm gonna go through and I'm I'm gonna read this article mostly in full and... I'm hoping, you know, Felix, you can give our, our listeners some of the important context and background because you have become something of a an autodidact on ki- the kingdom of Saudi Arabia and it's sort of th- that country. And you're working on a an article right now about Saudi that um, runs 100% counter to everything Dennis Ross is about to say. Let's get into it. Um, the title of this op-ed is, In Saudi Arabia... A Revolution Disguised as Reform uh, by Dennis Ross. So uh, let's just begin. He says, Today it's hard to be optimistic about anything in the Middle East, and yet, having just visited Saudi Arabia, in which I led a small bipartisan group of former national security officials, I came away feeling hopeful about the kingdom's future. Uh, First of all, I think it's interesting that uh, we're talking about Saudi Arabia, I guess it has changed it because they let a, a Jew set foot inside the country. So that's certainly a sign of progress. Baby steps. He continues, he says, That may seem paradoxical when some portray the Saudis as both arsonists and firefighters in the struggle with radical Islamists. While Saudi funding of madrasas internationally has contributed to the spread of a highly intolerant strain of Islam... I wonder whether a lag effect is causing the Saudis to be singled out for behaviors their leadership no longer embraces. Uh, (laughs) It's not madrasas. It's not fucking madrasas. It's that since the 70s, uh, since Prince Turkey Al Fasal's tenure as General Intelligence Director had started. Could you you just maybe let our our listeners know who these people are that, that you're referencing? All right. Uh, so Turkey Al Faisal was one of the. He's one of the higher ranking members of the Saudi royal family. He's he was the intelligence director from 1997 to 2006, I think, and he is now the Saudi ambassador to the United Kingdom. Uh, Turkey Al Faisal is responsible for the Saudi policy of giving weapons. Uh, infrastructure and training and sort of making them take this allegiance to Wahhabism to armed groups who pose any regional threat to Saudi Arabia. Now you say now <clears throat> you mentioned that they they give weapons to these groups, but doesn't Saudi Arabia buy all of their weapons from the UK and US? They do. Uh they do and John Dolan has talked about this. I mean Saudis generally can't use these weapons to any means because they don't really have an army. They have a protection racket. In fact, 
the event that sort of that kicked off this even deeper embrace of Salafism happened because uh, a group of radical of insurgents who you know like many before them and many after them thought that they were following the Mahdi uh, took the Grand Mosque and Saudi forces were unable to capture it back and they had to call it in Pakistani and French special forces and it was uh, humiliating because you know the Saudi military is just not competent but John Dolan has talked about how this is this is more this is an insurance policy that if anyone strikes against Saudi Arabia in their heart that this is a threat to their power that America would always have to come to back them up because then this hardline group would have all these weapons that Saudi Arabia bought it's collateral and you know you can also give them to whatever group of assholes that you want to arm and no one's going to do anything now, about it Dennis Ross says that um, he's he's worried that we may be singling out the Saudis like for instance if you mention the fact on 9-11 that 17 of the 19 hijackers were from Saudi, that would be singling them out. Ross continues, he says, In fact, the Saudi Arabia I just visited seemed like a different country from the one I've been visiting since 1991. There is an awakening underway in Saudi Arabia, but it is being led from the top. As one Saudi told us, there is a revolution here disguised as economic reform. While political change may not be in the offing, transformation is nonetheless taking place. Felix, what is he referring to? What's this revolution that's being led from the top? All right, so uh, I'm going to do a little spoilers for Dennis. Uh, first of all, I like how he says that it's different from what I saw in 1991. Well, yeah, it's been 25 fucking years, you moron. Of course, like, a few things are different. And those, you know, a few things are that they've built a few ugly buildings and... They've beheaded thousands of people since 1991. But he's talking about Saudi Vision 2030, which is one of the most hilarious things that anyone has intentionally put together on a PowerPoint and voluntarily showed the world. It's <laughs> Mohammed bin Salman, the 30-year-old defense minister and deputy crown prince, a new position they created specifically for him. Uh, this kid who's the son of King Salman, who has dementia, like Hillary and is leading the war in Yemen. Uh, his idea to transform Saudi Arabia from the top down is Saudi Vision 2030, where he says, among other things, like Dennis even writes out these points, like they're really good, very elaborate, articulated ideas. They're like, we need to spur development and innovation. And to some fucking amoeba like Dennis Ross, this is just incredible and proves that they're on the right track, even though women are still thrown in jail for their own rapes, uh, that migrant workers are still treated like slaves. But hey, you know, uh, the deputy crown prince did a so, PowerPoint about uh, apps. It's sort of like uh, the geopolitical version of uh, Theranos, right? Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> okay. Now, okay, isn't, uh, uh, well, isn't that guy also a Weibo? I heard that. Is he the one? Who loves Japan? No, he's not. He's not the Weibo. Um, there is an anime prince, but he lives in America. <laughs> I just love that there's a Saudi anime prince. I'm surprised there aren't more now that I think about it. Back to Dennis Ross. He says, uh, this transformation is nonetheless taking place. Stylistically, one sees it in the candor of the conversations with Saudi officials, not the hallmark of previous interaction, as well as a new work ethic, with several ministers telling us 80-hour work weeks are now the norm. Ugh. Haven't they been the norm for the slaves they have for a while now? <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. <laughs> it's like, now we're working as hard as our slaves are. Oh, shit. He says, um... Uh, when we asked how those in, bureau in the bureaucracy were reacting to the new demands, we heard that not everyone is happy, but the younger, junior officials now feel that they are part of something important have, and have embraced the new reality. Symbolically, the presence of women was notable in our meetings with the foreign minister and our visit to the College of Entrepreneurship, where half of the group we met were women. So yeah, oh, now they're leaning in now in Saudi Arabia, apparently. So yeah, I do. Dennis Ross went to a meeting where he like they presented him with like a couple women in the same room, and he was like, "Hmm, symbolically, this is a, a big difference than the last time I was here." And the next paragraph, he goes on just basically re re paraphrasing everything that was in the Vision Twenty Thirty, uh, you know, PowerPoint, where he says. 
they have ambitious plans to diversify the economy, end over-reliance on oil, keep capital in the country, and foster transparency and accountability. It's just this, you know, bloodless language of, yeah, of, of you know, innovation and proactive paradigm. They got over, y'all. Continuing, he says, skeptics have questioned whether Saudi Arabia can fulfill these goals, either because of a traditional culture that limits women too much, a workforce lacking key educational skills, or resistance from the conservative religious establishment. But the deputy crown prince and others argued that these that all these impediments can be overcome. A comprehensive reform of the educational system is being carried out. 80,000 80,000 students are studying abroad and returning to the kingdom with modern skills and a new mindset. And women are being increasingly integrated into jobs across all sectors. About 70% of the Saudi population is under 30, they noted, and these young people are not just open to change, they seek it. A um, lot going on here. You know, Dennis says limits women. I would say, like, you know, the wage, wage gap limits women. I would say <laughs> being murdered uh, and raped and in prison for your own rape, that... That's more than limiting women. It's actively harming them, but, you know, who's to say? No one we saw minimized the challenges of transforming the country, but the leaders conveyed a sense of mission and urgency. As Mohammed bin Salman told us, the government must do what it says it will do. And to that end, he took pride in pointing out that the government has succeeded in generating 30% more revenue, reducing the deficit beyond expectations, introducing discipline in the budgeting process, and importantly, ending the authority of the religious police to interrogate and arrest Saudi citizens. So, uh, I'm, I'm glad that they're balancing the dang budget. Oh my God, you can, I don't care, you can do a million 9-11s as long as you're doing entitlement reform. That's what <laughs> yeah, really fucking uh, matters. Are they ending the authority of religious police to interrogate and arrest Saudi citizens? I notice he doesn't say interrogate and arrest the guest workers that they use as a disposable, like, slave laborer. Well, the Mutawin, tech, the religious police, tech, they don't really, they're not really the ones who fuck with migrants. I mean, everyday Saudis really like to fuck with migrants. But uh, yeah, no, they no longer have the power to arrest. But if you're a woman, they can still fucking terrorize you. They can detain you. They can harass you. Uh, I was, for the article that I wrote, uh, I was told of one case recently where a religious police officer caught a young unmarried couple in a car and he told them that he was going to report them to the real authorities because, you know, while the religious police, they themselves cannot arrest, they can send you to a real cop who can still arrest you for religious crimes because that's still a concept that exists. And uh, he said if the woman didn't fuck him, uh, that she was going to the real police. But, you know, I'm sure she'll be glad to hear that Dennis thinks, uh, their authority has ended. Now, Felix, why don't you why don't you remind us or, or let, uh, remind everyone how 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 they kicked off uh, the beginning of this new year of reform back in January? Well, Saudi Arabia kicked off the new year as we all do by executing forty seven people on opaque charges of terrorism, really for nonviolent demonstrations. Chief among them was Namir al Namir, who was a Shia cleric who is anti-sectarian, he preached against sectarian no matter what government did it, no matter if Sunnis or Shia did it. I've I've actually had people from Sri Lanka mes- message me about Namir al-Namir and say that he like inspired people and their family to be better people and not be sectarian, but you know, his only crime was really preaching against a world which the Saudi government needs to exist in order to rule. Because their their ide their governing ideology is sectarian. They don't consider Shia as fellow Muslims or even fellow human beings. Um, Namir was killed in front of his son. His remains have not been given back to his family. But you know, I'm sure that he was just killed because he wanted there to be regulations for Uber or something. I'm sure um, it was non-ideological. Is part of this reform, are they going to switch to uh, lethal injection instead of beheadings? Ah, we'll see. I mean, I don't, you know, you got to keep the traditions, but, you know, maybe there will be a beheading sharing app where <coughs> uh, you put your location on the dot and a swordsman comes to you and cuts off your wife's head for uh, supposed witchcraft. Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, I, if this weren't bad enough, the last three paragraphs, um, get your popcorn ready and your Gallagher-like plastic sheeting, because, uh, oh boy. Will the Saudis succeed in producing a national make- makeover? There will be opposition, and any stumbles will be exploited by the forces of tradition. Moreover, the war in Yemen may drain resources and in time public support, or the preoccupation with Iran or Iranian efforts at subversion could prove distracting and hard to overcome. Dennis is uh, sort of like preemptively setting up uh, that should any of this fail, it's because of Iranian subversion is what he's trying to do here. And I like the idea that the problem with the war in Yemen is optics, not the fact that they're massacring civilians by the thousands. Yeah, it's draining yeah. resources. Yeah, I mean, the biggest victim of the war in Yemen is the budget deficit. Continuing, he says, but the United States surely has a stake in the success of the Saudi transformation process. Aside from ensuring stability in the kingdom, its success could at long last demonstrate an Arab leadership capable of remaking its society from within without terrible upheaval. The next administration should offer technical assistance with the Aramco IPO and economic reforms more generally. Uh, Felix, what is the Aramco IPO? All right, so one of uh, Mohammed bin Salman's brilliant ideas that shows he's not just a fucking foul son moron is that he wants to sell Saudi Aramco. Um, No one really knows how much Aramco is worth. It's the Saudi National Oil Company. Uh, But it would be in the trillions neighborhood. I don't know where you would find a group or even any buyers who would spend trillions of dollars on an oil company when it looks like the people want to transition off of oil. But hey, you know, dream big. Shoot for well, the wouldn't they have? I mean, isn't the whole thing that they won't tell people how much oil they have, right? Like, Saudi uh, well, Arabia no, they, they they disclose proven reserves and uh, you know the sort of emergency stockpile, but I mean, not not in the way that America does. They've been not they haven't cut down production in a while. They've helped keep the price of of oil low to sort of spite Iran because. Saudis can still make money off of oil that's priced so low, but Iran really can't. Is that just, because of, of embargoes? Not really embargoes, but sort of like the, the Saudis have more efficient technology as far as processing oil. Of getting it to market? really don't. Yeah. Getting it to market, processing it. But I guess it is embargoes too. I mean, the Saudis just have more resources to create economies of scale that make it cheaper for them to... Uh, sell oil at a profit. Okay. Uh, Moving on, Ross says, uh, the Saudis have two priorities, modernization domestically and countering perceived Iranian adventurism externally. What is Iranian adventurism in in, in this context? Um, I don't know what adventurism is, uh, but I noticed that every guy like Dennis Ross, they really, they're sick of Iran's meddling. But when Saudi Arabia... You know, to this day, to this day, there are rich Saudi falsons dicking around in Syria, uh, putting women in cages, beheading children. But for some reason, that doesn't really get mentioned in the same breath. Not to mention you that know, you can, Dennis Ross. I mean, almost. I don't even. I don't know this for a fact, but I'm stating it because I'm a hundred percent positive it's true. Uh, Dennis Ross also probably supported the war in Iraq. I mean, that's no. He absolutely did. He, that that's he meddling in the did. Middle East. Dennis um, Ross was a member of Project for a New American Century. He oh, absolutely wonderful, supported wonderful. the war in Iraq. He signed two policy letters on it. Oh, and good. And and I'm glad, again, like you said, I'm glad Obama appointed this guy to his administration. That was well done. Team of rivals, baby. Yeah. Uh, he says, okay, Ross continues. Our next president should propose a strategic dialogue as well as a contingency planning for dealing with security threats. Such planning would do much to reassure the Saudis at a time when their leadership believes the United States fails to understand the threat from Iran and its use of Shiite militias to undermine Arab governments. Oh, I, I just no. This, this breaks my heart that uh, our, the leadership of America isn't doing enough to reassure the Saudi royal family. All right, this is the last paragraph. I'm going to read it all the way through, and then uh, we'll discuss. The Saudis are not imagining Iranian troublemaking in the region or their financing of Hezbollah and other terrorist groups. 
Ironically, it may be the Saudis who have the better chance to transform their country and truly develop. Unlike the Iranians, they may not be inhibited by ideology. They have a plan for modernization, and their leaders, in contrast to Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, want to open up their country. I wouldn't bet against them. Place your bets, folks. Uh, Dennis Ross is going hard on Saudi Arabia to become a modern progressive country before Iran does. Based um, on... I would like a fucking what? What is what is beyond bare assertion? What the fuck is his... It, they, well, you see, hold on a minute. It, I know it does seems counterintuitive, and I know that the Saudis fund way more terrorist groups than Iran does, but hold me out. They're the ones who wrote me a giant fucking check. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, and and they made a PowerPoint for me, and uh, I ate some scones with women in a meeting for the first time I went inside the country in 25 years, and uh, yeah, no, things are looking up, guys. Yeah, the sadder part is to, to, to consider that maybe it doesn't even require a, a selfish motive on his part. They're, these guys are just that fucking gullible that all you need is the is the patina of the sort of Silicon Valley inflected innovation and disruption talk and they're immediately going to just melt because they've been so conditioned to find that to be the definition of progression in the 21st century. It's like, ooh, you guys you guys have you guys have an action plan. Oh my god. This like I said at the beginning of this, there I I, I really discern like a full court press going on right now in sort of one half of the foreign policy establishment in this country and then of course the people who pay them in the Gulf states to make sure that Iran is the major villain in the world and and, and not them. That Iran is the United States' chief adversary in the world despite all evidence to the contrary. It really is baffling. It, I, it's just, you hear this and you're like, what and, world are you watching? What, 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 what I mean, even if you actually do think terrorism is a huge problem and the America's uh, defense posture in the world needs to be organized around stopping it, who the fuck does terrorism against the United States? It's not, it's and basically never been Iran, ever. I mean, the closest thing is the barracks bombing in Lebanon in the 80s, but I'm sorry, those guys were Marines, that's not a terrorist attack, that's a military attack. Yeah, and, and they kidnapped and tortured to death the CIA station chief in Beirut. We've mentioned that before, but, I mean... Yeah, I guess that's, that's, that's it. Not, is that, like, Iran has yeah. actually gone after, like, guys who were part of this shitty network of, of deep state operatives, and so there's, like... Now, th there's a personal vendetta as opposed to yeah. the, the Sunni terrorists. Ah, they just kill a bunch of schmucks in office buildings and airplanes. Who gives a shit? Yeah. Um, now, I, I mentioned the Dennis Ross piece. I, you know, again, this is 15th anniversary of 9-11. I came across an amazing piece this morning. This is by a guy named Kyle Orton, not the former Bears quarterback, but this is a guy with the Henry Jackson Society, which is the same septic tank that spawned Michael Weiss. He has an article uh, out today titled, this is actually in uh, Brendan's uh, former digs, the International Business Times. The title of the article is, After 15 Years, Why Aren't We Talking About Iran's Role in 9-11? I'm not making this up. <laughs> Great I'm question. not Great making question. this up. Great. The, the, sub, the subhead Rack is, em. There is an extensive Al-Qaeda network feeding global branches based in the Islamic Republic. These people do not care at all what comes out of their mouth. And they know that for the most part, no one will ever call them on this. But I mean, this is really, our, I mean, this is unbelievable. Like, I mean, it was amazing when they tried to connect Iraq to 9-11, but I, they're, now they're trying to chewhorn Iran in there. And, you know, I had a thought this morning when I read this, and uh, let, me, let me ask you guys what you think about this. The thought was that we're talking about Ari Fleischer going back in a time machine so that he can experience the glory of 9-11 all over again. I truly believe that had these people had access to some kind of time machine or had foreknowledge of the idea or the fact that Iraq would be their one and only bite at this apple, they would have skipped Iraq and gone straight to Iran. They wouldn't have, they wouldn't have bothered with yeah, Iraq. Yeah, no, that's true. Yeah, I mean, like, uh, yeah. Like, a, a lot of people want to argue that Iraq was not this attempt at a regional reordering and, and, and you know, because it's like, well, we went into Iraq and then the Iranians ended up increasing their influence. That was pretty stupid. If 
if the goal had been for a U.S. hegemony, they wouldn't have done that. But that's because they fucked it up. That's because it was supposed to be the staging ground for an, a complete military reorganization of the Middle East that was going to go in east and west directions towards Syria and Iran. But they fucking stepped on their dicks the entire time because they were a bunch of homeschooled dipshits who uh, didn't know what the hell they were doing. But here's the thing, like, if you are the Henry Jackson Institute or any of these Project for a New American Century creeps or any of their toadies in the press, the dream is still alive. They, they, it's just, they've been set back by Iraq by probably 10, 15 years, but they're still at it. Like, they haven't been chastened one whit, in, like, not even in the slightest. Their, their eyes are still on the prize. And oh, they're absolutely. still trying to make it happen. Yeah, it's, uh, they're it's like, almost at, they're like, uh, the great Gatsby. They see that, uh, they see the green light of the IRGC from across the lake. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I, I, any closing thoughts on this? I mean, this was, I mean, I, I, I just found like my threshold for these kind of things. I'm usually never surprised, but I was really aghast at how brazen, just not like just how lazy and how open th- this like just pure propaganda was in, in a major American newspaper. I mean, I guess I shouldn't be surprised, but I was. Yeah, um, I don't really have that much to say. I've been mad about this article for three days. And yeah, it showed that he just doesn't really, people like Ross really don't give a shit how idiotic they look to anyone who knows anything about the subject. It's just pure repulsive cynicism. But those people don't matter. No. They, they, I mean, yeah, they don't I matter. Mean, and, and neither do the lives of anyone who has to live in Saudi Arabia, for instance. Or Yemen, like, for that matter. Yeah, or Yemen, yeah, or yeah. anywhere in the world. But, I mean, I guess just we have to look forward to, uh, Felix, your article on uh, Saudi as a sort of, I don't know, chaser to this atrocity. Yeah, we look forward to that or Dennis Ross possibly getting like one of his balls caught in an escalator and being slowly disemboweled by the entire <laughs> machinery of it. So uh, before we close out the show, I think we should dip into the uh, mailbag. We haven't done that uh, feature in a while. Oh, oh my God. Before I forget, we have to promote, we have a live show coming up on September 24th. Hell yeah, folks. Hell yeah, we do. Short. I know it's a, it's sort of short notice. It's like basically two weeks from now. Saturday, September 24th, Chapo and Carl Diggler. It's the Chapo Trap House and Digcast Podcasts live at Genius Headquarters in, in Brooklyn. $10 to the door. Advanced tickets will be available. Uh, just check out the Chapo Trap House or any of our Twitter feeds for information. We're going to be plugging the show all week, but it's going to be... It's in Gowanus. Uh, okay. It's us three in Gowanus. Uh, it's us three and Virgil, Texas... Uh, a live show if you're in the New York City area we would love it if you would come out uh, for a ch- the next Chapo live event September 24th and at the end of the night oh, I'm yeah. going to jump into the Gowanus Canal and you can see what I look like <laughs> when I come out <laughs> <laughs> the toxic Chapo Avenger no drinks will be provided by uh, the Gowanus Brewery it's a craft beer brewed with runoff from the Gowanus Canal Two dollars, two dollars a pop, cheap. Can't can't beat it, folks. So yeah, like I said, uh, we'll be posting on all of our accounts. Uh, you know, hopefully constantly uh, to promote this show. If you guys could share, spread the word, it would be much appreciated. But we would love it if you guys would all come out Saturday, September twenty fourth. Um, so, getting that little business out of the way, let's dip into the mailbag for some reader mail, listener mail. Uh, first question comes from uh, uh, Nikhil uh, Menendez. Again, horribly, I probably butchered that name. Please correct me. I want to do better. Uh, he says, firstly, just wanted to say that the podcast is beyond good. Getting a new episode is the genuine highlight of my week. Thank you very much. He says, I have a question for the mailbag that might sound like the beginnings of a Cointelpro operation to design to, to sow dissent among the Grey Wolves. My question is, what do you guys disagree upon? especially in the realm of politics and foreign policy, where do you feel most opposed to one another? Uh, great question. Uh, not sure how to answer it. I mean, I, I don't know if we disagree on much in, or anything all that significant in foreign policy. Uh, I can say Matt and Felix uh, both um, disdain the city of New York, and that's a 
that's a that's a chasm between us that that will one day tear us asunder. I don't know. What would you guys say? Um. While I myself am more into the concept of polyamory, Matt and Will are more into the concept of bigamy. And yes, there are differences. <laughs> I would say that uh, we can't stop arguing about which uh, ethnic movement we back in the South Sudanese Civil War. Uh, I'm all about the FTLA, Dinka, Dinka, Dinka Power, all the way. And there are a couple of disgusting uh, SPLM uh, uh, Nura supporters and I spit on them. Let's not let no, let's, let's not let's I, we said we would never talk about this again. Let's move on. I don't I don't want to go there. I can't even Both of you are dead to me. <laughs> uh next one this is not so much a uh question but a, a comment from Augusto uh Dabos who's a uh, he's he's written in before, but he said, uh, I've started making phrenology jokes because of Chapo, and now my sister is really mad at me because I said she can't go to, into humanities because of her Armenioid brow ridge. I have no question. <laughs> I just wanted to share that. <laughs> that makes you a super... If you fuck up familial relations because of your fandom, that makes you a super fan. Uh, the... The next, again, this is uh, not a question. This is uh, just a sort of a comment. Someone's sharing this. Um, this comes to us from uh, Christopher, who says, uh, My partner and I are involved with uh, prison reform and activism, and part of this involves being part of a prison writing program. Most of the inmates we write to are regular small town guys who like trucks, tattoos, family, sports, boobs, and the insane clown posse. And twins. Uh, sorry. <laughs> This is in the context of our discussion of uh, alt-right dorks and uh, the Aryan Brotherhood. Uh, they continue, says, except William. William's interests include ancient Rome, Alexander the Great, fantasy novels, anime, and his German ancestry. <laughs> His letters, which can be over 20 pages long, are strewn with Latin quotations and handwritten emoticons. He often complains about the plebeian tastes of his fellow inmates. <laughs> uh, William is half white and half Native American. He has been excluded by Native gangs for being an annoying white cracker, and the Aryan Brotherhood won't let him join despite his knowledge of pagan mythology. There's a, there's a cliche that committing serious crimes will get you respect in the joint, but this is not true at all. William is serving a life sentence in Wisconsin for multiple homicides while on parole. <laughs> but the general popular opinion of him is that he's still a huge nerd. The prison yard is very high school, which why it is a relatable allegory for the alt-right. So an alt-writer in prison would be a lot like they are now, lonely incels who retreat into a fantasy world while spending most of their time alone in their room, unable to function in the society that they want to be overlords of. Except in prison, there's mandatory showers and no internet access. Love the work you guys do. But she also, he also says, Chris says in the PS, we have mailed several copies of Applebee's America to inmates in the hopes of finding the navigators of the correctional system who will ditch the pants-sagging thug culture of prison gangs and instead use their gut values and connections to create bipartisan, life-targeting strategies. So, Chris, thank you so much for spreading Applebee's America inside America's yeah. prisons. And I have to say, God uh, bless you. I mean, I always operate on the assumption that we are the one unerring sort of voice in American politics and culture, uh, and it's just nice to have that confirmed. We're always yeah. correct. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And even when we're not correct, reality usually bends to exactly. fit our narrative. Exactly. We will be right eventually. If we're not right at the moment, we will be soon. Next question. Uh, this is Jacob, and he says, I really want a Chapo t-shirt. Can't seem to find them online. Do you guys only do them at live shows? Thanks, Jake. Uh, Jake, uh, we are working on getting merch available. Uh, we have our... we've have our own domain name we're putting together a website that'll hopefully be the like i said the sort of home base for all of our content and our chapo merchandise we are working on getting merch baseball hats and t-shirts uh soon but just uh sit tight they're coming soon when we can get our shit together which could be i don't know a while but rest assured we want you to have t-shirts we don't want you to be naked out there no naked boys so, uh, I think 